Pay attention to the path that you're on. Look, both you and I know that you'll forget most of what I say today. But remember this one phrase, pay attention to the path that you're on. A few months ago, I gave you the story of the longest date I had ever been on. I went hiking with a lady on Hawk Mountain, which is up by the Appalachian Trail, and she told me she really knew the, the trails up there, and so I believed her. And we were hiking for over eight hours, got lost, and it was a crazy time. Why? Because we didn't pay attention to the path we were on. You know they have those trail markers that usually spray painted a certain color so you know if you're on the right path. Well, we weren't paying attention to the right path and making sure we we're on the right trail. But to be fair, sometimes those markers weren't very clear and sometimes they weren't very well marked. And that's how it is in life, isn't it? Sometimes the path isn't clear. Sometimes we don't know the right direction to go. And that's why, listen, that's why Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are like those trail markers guiding us, pointing us in the right direction, giving us the right way to go. And throughout Proverbs, Solomon is pleading with you and me, pay attention to the path that you're on. Go the right direction. Choose the right path, the good and godly path. And that's why it's important for us to pay attention to the path we're on. Because, and you and I both know this, because the wrong path will lead you to heartache, frustration, poverty, broken relationships, wayward children. The wrong path will get you into all kinds of trouble. But the right path leads to honor, wealth, long life, and peace. So pay attention to the path that you're on. Today we're going to look at some of those trail markers that will keep you and me on the right path. And we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 22 and 23. Verse 1 of 22 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Your reputation is more important than money. When you hear the name Mother Teresa, for example, what comes to mind? It's love, service, humility. I'll tell you what doesn't come to mind is wealth, great riches. Mother Teresa didn't have money, but she had, and she still has, a good name, a good reputation. And that is more important. That is better than wealth. Consider also Mother the Mary of Jesus. She was poor and young, and yet... All generations honor her name because she said, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm humble. God, use me in whatever way you want. And her name, her reputation was more important than money or wealth. What do people think when they hear your name? Are you focused on building wealth or building your reputation? A good name is more desirable. It's better than great riches. Next, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, <clears throat> and the one who borrows is servant to the one who lends. Watch out for debt, this proverb says. When you borrow money, you're not free. You're serving the one who loaned you that money, whether it's the bank, Visa, MasterCard. You're working to pay off the bills. And now what's interesting is in the Old Testament law, it was okay for a Hebrew to buy another Hebrew. Listen, to what it says, it, well, it's, it's sort of like an indentured servant, the word indentured meaning a, a contract. And you'd have this contract where the servant would say, I'll agree to work for you if you agree to feed me and give me shelter. It's a good deal for someone who couldn't make it on their own. And it's different than slavery. In slavery, there's no choice. It's by force. But these servants are choosing to serve their master. And it's this law, uh, there was a law that the servant could work for six years, but on the seventh year, the man was set free. And if he says, the scripture tells us, if he says, hey, I actually think this is a good deal, and I really love my master. I want to keep working for him. I want to be his slave. He treats me well, and it's better than me going out on my own. Then if that's the case, the servant can go and tell the master, and the master can take him to the judge and make the contract binding, and he takes him to the doorpost, and he uses an awl, 
and he pierces his ear against the doorpost. And I remember singing a song when I was at, at camp, uh, pierce my ear, O Lord my God, take me to your door this day. I will serve no other God. O oh, oh Lord, I'm here to stay. It's a way of saying, God, I'm serving you and you alone. I love you and I'm working for you. Serving God is a good thing. Paying off your bills is a good thing. But debt is a bad thing. By the way, uh, Trinity still has some debt. And my hope is that we completely pay this off by this time next year. No debt at all. And that might be a good plan for some of you. Some of you are slaves to debt or servants to your debt. And Solomon is saying, it's like you're working for someone else. And that's exactly what debt does for you and for me. So choose the right path and get out of debt if you're in debt. Okay, verse 13. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I'll be murdered in the streets. And this is the same idea repeated in chapter 26. The sluggard said, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. The sluggard is this lazy person and he comes up with, as you see here, any crazy excuse to get out of work. Of course, lions weren't in the streets. They were in the forest. But this lazy guy, he says, I can't go out of the, the house. What if there's a lion out there? What if he eats me up? What are you, crazy? I can't go to work because I'm going to get killed. Benjamin Franklin said, a good man, or a, a, a man good for making excuses is good for nothing else. What imaginary lions keep you from doing your work? Some imaginary lions that keep you from your goals, excuses that you come up with. Pay attention to the path you're on when it comes to your work ethic. Don't be giving lame excuses to get out of work. And a uh, reminder, chapter 10, okay, now we're going to look here. As a reminder, chapter 10 through chapter 22, verse 22, uh, or verse 16 rather, is called the Proverbs of Solomon. These are individual Proverbs that are given by Solomon. Now, there's this shift here. Chapter 22, verses 17 to 21, introduces a new section in Proverbs, and it's the heading, the sayings of the wise. And check this out, from chapter 22, verse 22, to chapter 24, verse 22, we read 30 sayings collected from wise men, wise sayings. And these wise men, who are these wise men? We don't know, but we do know this, that there's, there, there's variations of these 30 sayings that were actually already recorded at this time in Egypt. During the time of Ramses, they, these collections of, of uh, wise sayings were already there. And so get this, Solomon takes wisdom from the current culture, the culture that's out there. He adapts it, Christianizes it, so to speak, and he makes it part of the Bible. We read it as part of Proverbs. And here's the point. All truth is God's truth. Augustine says something similar to that. All truth comes from God. All truth is from God. And so in it, if an atheist says there is no God, we say that's not true. But an if an atheist says everyone should be kind to the poor, we could say, in agreement with him, that is true. So Solomon is saying we can glean wisdom even from cultures that don't believe in God if it's true. Because all truth is God's truth. Look at verse 17 to 21. This is the introduction to these 30 sayings. Pay attention, notice this theme once again, pay attention and listen to the wise sayings and apply your heart to what I teach. So we listen, we pay attention, and we apply it. For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips, get ready to use them so that your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you, I have... Have I not written 30 sayings? And here are the 30 sayings that are uh, found, again, in Egyptian culture and other cultures. Sayings of counsel and knowledge, teaching you true and reliable words so that you can give an answer to him who sent you. Now, who's this one who sent you? Some say perhaps it's your, your parents, 
uh, a teacher, a boss, and some would say that it's God himself sending you. So you can give an account to God when he says, what have you done with the wisdom that I've given you? So we can keep um, these 30 sayings in the forefront of our mind, ready to use so that we know when we face God or our parents or our boss, we are ready with a wise uh, saying. So this, the first of these uh, wise sayings was about the poor. The Egyptian saying is this, beware of robbing the poor and oppressing the afflicted. Solomon tweaks that and he says in verses 22 and 23, do not exploit the poor because they're poor and do not crush the needy in court for the Lord will take up their case and will plunder those who plunder them. Both Republicans and Democrats would say, be kind to the poor. Both Christians and non-Christians would say, be kind to the poor. Watch out for the, the poor. All truth is God's truth. The difference here is that it's the Lord who avenges those who mistreat the poor. So be careful how you treat the poor, the under-resourced, because God will avenge them. Verse 24 and 25 continues. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate, associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Pay attention to who you're hanging out with. In chapter 13, Solomon says it like this. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Avoid the chronically angry person. The Hebrew word here or the phrase is literally the man of heat. We would say the hothead, the hot-headed man. You know the this type, don't you? You know the, the type, of, they're sort of like a bomb ready to go off. They have a short fuse and they'll explode devastating everything in their way. So Solomon says, in using this collection of wisdom from the, the culture around, avoid the angry person because you don't want to get sucked into the same trap. You don't want to become like him. You ever notice that you become like the people that you hang out with? If you are complaining all the time, or it's probably because you're around people who are complaining all the time. If you're really thankful, have a grateful heart, it's sometimes because you're hanging out with people who are grateful and thankful all the time. And, and here it's saying, if you're around people who are angry, it's going to rub off on you. So be careful who you're hanging out with. Pay attention to the path that you're on and watch who you're hanging out with. Proverbs 23 now, verses 4 and 5. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Leo Tolstoy wrote a short story called How Much Land Does a Man Need? And in fact, the author James Joyce said that this short story is the greatest story in all of literature. And it's about this peasant named um, Pehom. Pehom. Pehom is given this offer for a thousand rubles. He's given this offer that he can walk around as much land as he can um, walk around starting at daybreak, marking his route with a spade. And as much as he can cover... Uh, in that day, when he returns back to the starting point by sunset, all that land will be his for a thousand rubles. But if he doesn't reach the starting point, he'll lose not only the money, the thousand rubles, but also the land. He won't get any of it. And so Pehom thinks this is a great bargain because he knows he can cover a lot of land. And so he sets out walking at daybreak and he covers a lot of land and uh, the, then he notices as the sun starts uh, getting ready to set, he starts realizing that he's pretty far away from his starting point. And so he starts running and everyone is cheering him on and saying, come on, you can make it. And he runs back and he just in time makes it 
to the starting point where he began as the sun sets. But in the twist, exhausted from the run, Pehom drops over dead. And so Solomon says, through these collected wisdom of the surrounding culture, for you and for me, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Show the wisdom, have the wisdom to show restraint. Verse 5 gives the reason not to wear yourself out for money and stuff is cast your, your eyes or glance at riches and they're gone for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. The Hebrew word fly is used twice here. Don't let your eyes fly to riches. Don't, don't keep looking at riches because once your eyes land on the riches, guess what's going to happen? They're going to fly off. So your eyes fly to the riches and guess they're, they're just going to fly away like an eagle. So don't wear yourself out to get rich. How much do you really need? Have the wisdom to show restraint. Next, verses 10 and 11. Do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach on the fields of the fatherless, for their defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. Fields and property were marked by boundary stones. So imagine if you had a dishonest neighbor who would move boundary stones marking off your property and his property just a few inches every single month. He could steal your land little by little, just a little bit at a time. And it would be really hard to prove that he's moving this boundary stone. And this is especially an easy uh, crime uh, w for widows and orphans. They're an easy target because they wouldn't have the resources to fight against it in court. They need a defender or a protector. And the Hebrew word here is goel, which is the same word used as boaz in the book of Ruth. Boaz was the, the kingdom redeemer, the one who was the protector of Ruth, who came to her rescue. And uh, the fatherless, in, in this verse, the fatherless don't have this kingdom or this uh, kinsman redeemer. So are they without hope? And, and this passage says, no, God himself will come to their defense. He will protect them. He'll come to their aid. He'll defend and protect them. And in the court of law, you're going to lose. The bottom line is don't be greedy. Don't steal from your neighbor, not even a little bit. Don't take advantage, especially of the poor and the needy. Look now at verses 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. Now, when you first read this, it seems to say, go ahead and beat your kids. Don't worry, they're not going to die, as long as you don't beat them too hard. And some parents are going, I actually like this proverb. But read it again. If you punish him, he will not die. Put a pause there. If you punish him, what's the result? He's not going to die. He's not going to die a premature death because you disciplined him, because you punished him. In other words, when you discipline your child, you're really saving your child from a premature death. When you discipline your child, he's not going to go astray. And that discipline will actually save your child in the end. Now, in chapter 13, verse 24, it says the same kind of thing in a paradoxical way. He who spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is careful to discipline him. So this, this paradox, which parent loves his kids more? The one who is firm with them and disciplines them or the one who lets the kid just run wild and do whatever he wants? And it's a balance, of course, and we see this balance throughout Proverbs as well. We need to have strong discipline of our children, but we also need loving uh, times of education. And this proverb isn't endorsing Corporal punishment, bodily harm, flogging with the, the rod. It's, it's saying to parents, hey, it's your responsibility to teach and correct your children. And if you do that, if you discipline your child, even if it seems harsh in the end, it's love. 
in the end, you're helping your child and you're saving them from death. Letting your kids run wild, see, run wild seems to be the loving approach. But if you truly love your kids, you need to discipline them, to dare to discipline. And that discipline, though it seems harsh and cruel, actually will save the child's life. So parents, pay attention to the path you're on when it comes to disciplining your children. Don't be too cruel and don't be too relaxed either. Okay, last verse. Verse 19. Listen, my son, and be wise and keep your heart on the right path. Now we come full circle again and we say again, pay attention to the path that you're on. Pay attention to the path that you're on right now. Look at those trail markers to make sure you're heading the right direction. Trail markers like the book of Proverbs that, that teach you how to be on the right path to show you the right direction in life. By the way, just because you're on the right path doesn't mean you, you don't need to pay attention anymore. I was hiking with a, a buddy again up by the Appalachian Trail and right on the path, we were you know, walking on the right path, going the right direction, and all of a sudden, we heard this this rattle, and he and I both jumped. He, he jumped a little bit more because the rattlesnake was closer to him than it was to me, and we were on the right path, but sometimes just because you're on the right path doesn't mean there's not danger. When you're on the right path, guess what's going to happen? Satan will try to still take you out. He'll try to get you off the path. So pay attention, even if you're on the right path, to make sure you're still on the right path, staying on the right path. Pay attention because Satan will try to take you off the path. And here's what I want you to ask yourself today, not just with Proverbs, but with any area of your life right now. I want you to ask these two questions. First, am I on the right path? In, in various areas of my life right now, and if we look at Proverbs here, when it comes to your reputation, your debt, your excuses to avoid work, your discipline of children, the way you treat the poor, are you on the right path? And if you're on the right path, keep going. Stay on the path and don't let Satan try to get you off the path. So are you on the right path? Are you listening to God's word? Are you following the trail markers, Proverbs, and other scripture that's helping you along the right path? Are you listening to God's voice? Are you on the right path? And the second question is this. If you notice you're on the wrong path, you're going the wrong direction, ask this question. What one thing do I need to change to get back on the right path? Or Perhaps, it, you know, it's just a course correction. You get off the path for a little bit and then you notice, I, I'm not following the markers anymore. I need to get back on the right path. And then sometimes in life, you realize you're totally going the wrong direction. And when I was hiking with this young lady, you know, on this date, we realized after a while we were on totally the wrong path. And the best thing we could do was not keep going straight because that was the wrong path the best thing we could do was stop right where we were and do a 180, turn around and go the opposite direction. And this is what the Bible calls repentance. It's doing a 180, a turnaround, saying I, I've been going the wrong way and this is how our response should be to God. God, I'm, I'm, I've been going the wrong way and I need to stop and turn around and go the right way. And perhaps that's you. Perhaps this is the second question. Is there, is there something I need to change? God, what do I need to change? If I'm not on the right path, I'm on the wrong path or I've gotten off the right path, what do I need to do to get back on the right path? And may, maybe you need to repent. And look, we've all gotten off the, wrong, uh, off the right path and onto the wrong path. We all need a course correction in some area of our life. And this is the good news. That's why Jesus died for us, for me, and for you. God allows U-turns. God allows course corrections. Jesus died for us because all of us have sinned. 
and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have gotten off the right path and onto the wrong path. And so we all, in some area of our life, we need a course correction. How about you? Where do you need a course correction in your life? Perhaps you need to repent of something, a sin right now, and do a 180. Go completely the opposite direction. Or maybe you just realize you're going off a little bit. You're not, you're not totally off the right path, but you're, you're just veering off and you sort of lost your way for a little while and yet you see the right path and you just need to do a course correction and get back on. What's one area of your life right now where you need to get on the right path? Whether you need to repent or just get back on to the right path. One area right now, whether it's one of these areas we covered in Proverbs or something else that God has been recently tugging on your heart, what's one area of your life that you just need to change and do a course correction? Pay attention to the path that you're on. Pay attention to the path that you're on right now. And I want to give you some time right now to, to just pray, and I want you to pray that simple prayer. God, I want you to put me on the right path. Whatever it is in your life right now, God, Put me on the right path. God, if you need to repent, take some time right now. You can, uh, you know, right after the message, right after the prayer, take some time and just say, God, I've been wrong. I've been going down the wrong path and I just need to stop and go back to you. Get on the right path. Now, after, after I pray, I want you to just take a few minutes, and this is the challenge. I want you to just take a few minutes after the message, after you listen to this, and just be still before the Lord and say, God, I, I want to pay attention to the path that I'm on right now. Is the path that I'm on the right path? And if it is, Lord, help me to have the strength to keep going without getting distracted by Satan. And if I'm on the wrong path or going completely on the wrong path, Lord, I repent. And I want to change at least just this one thing. What is that one thing that God is, is asking you to change right now, to make a course correction, to repent right now? So let me pray and then continue to pray after the message about that one thing for you. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you today that you allow U-turns that when we get off the path, you allow, allow us to have course corrections. We ask that you would put us on the right path. And we ask that you would keep Satan away from us as he tries to get us off the path. As he tries to destroy us from being on the right path with you. Teach us, Lord, daily to pay attention to the path that we're on. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Trinity. I hope to see you soon.